Amen. Happy Father's Day to all the men in the house. Can we just celebrate all the fathers in the house today? Come on, let's give it up. Hey, if, if I'm the first one to tell you or if I'm the only one to tell you, let me just tell you something. Men, look up here at me. Look up here at me. If you're a father, if you're acting as a father in, in, a, in a child's life, I'm proud of you. We're proud of you. God is happy to see what you're doing in your life. Come on, one more time for all the fathers in the house today. We're proud of you. Proud of you. It's not an easy not an easy job. <laughs> not an easy job. So before we jump into today's message, I want to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Give it up for yourselves. You're amazing. We love this church. We love you. We're so excited. Uh, we have a mission here, and you can say it with me if you know it. It's to be a lifeline by leading people and becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. That's what, we, uh, that's what we're so excited about. That's why we wake up early. That's why we go to bed late. That's why we serve. That's why we do all the things that we do. In fact, uh, let me just tell you about a little opportunity that you have. Next week, uh, Growth Track, and we're calling it Fast Track because we're doing it all in one day. After church on, uh, on the next week, I don't know what, the 25th, thank you so much. You are my rock. Um, on the 25th, we're doing Fast Track. Let me just tell you a little bit about this. This is how you would integrate yourself into the church family. This is how you would, um, the old way to say it would become a member or just to serve. What we talk about is you're on the team. You're on the dream team. Let me just tell you a little bit about it. It's, it's really an opportunity for you to get the most out of your church. Man, you can come and you can hang out with us and you can enjoy Sunday services and you can get a lot out of that too and, and be encouraged, be refreshed. But let me just tell you something. There's going to be something left on the table as long as you tarry on taking this, this step right here. And so it's, it's an invitation to you next week. And it is an investment. Let me just be clear. It's an investment of your time. And so next, next week when we're going to provide you lunch, but you can hang out with us and hear all about the heart of the church. But it is an investment of time. And then on top of that, we're going to ask you to join the team and, and begin to serve in, in some levels. But I would never tell you that and just say it's only going to be a sacrifice to you. It is also going to be a benefit to you. And it's really, you will find true meaning and true fulfillment. And everything that the local church is meant to be is going to be found through that step. So if you're ready for that, if, if it's time for you to take that step, next week's your week. Come and join us. Amen. All right, that's, that's Growth Track happening next week. And one more little announcement before we get started. We're having a fireworks booth this year. Fireworks booth. Yes, get excited about that. It's going to be awesome. And let me just tell you a little bit about that. Thank you so much for that. Like, yeah, fireworks booth. So we've got also, this is, I'm looking at it as, a, as an outreach. Honestly, I'm looking at the fireworks booth that we're going to be doing right outside of BevMo. All right, come on, somebody. It's going to be lit. <laughs> it's going to be lit, everybody. But it's, the, it's that week leading up to the 4th of July, and we have an opportunity to meet thousands of people. Thousands of people who are outside of the church, not even maybe interested in the church, not, not even thinking anything about it, but we have an opportunity to encounter them, to interact with them, and to show them how life-giving, it's because the church, we think of the church as like the building, you know, it's like, oh, we got to come to the church, but you're the church. We are the church, and if we can begin to show people that, hey, you know, we're just people in here, and, and we've and we really enjoy what we've gotten out of this experience of being a part of the church. And we can begin to show people, I'm looking at this as an outreach. I'm looking at this as an outreach. So I would encourage you, we've got a, we've got a sign up in the back. You can also sign up on that giant QR code right there. And you can sign up to serve for a, a, even a short shift, uh, any length of time, the week before 4th of July. This is the fireworks booth outreach. This is how we're talking about it. And uh, can I hand me one of those little movie tickets right here? You probably sat on one of these at the movies. Come on. At the movies, somebody. Anybody who's been here longer than a year knows that at the movies is probably our most exciting series of the entire year. The entire year. And the schedule of the movies that we're going to be playing are on the back. We take modern day movies, modern day stories, modern day parables, and use them to communicate biblical truths. It's really hard to explain. You've got to see it to believe it. It is so much fun, and we're going to be handing these out to all of those people coming to the fireworks booth, but, but be clear. You can hand these out to any of your friends. I'm, I'm believing that they have never experienced anything like this, your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers. If they're thinking about church or if they're just, they have this idea about church that it's forgive me, but like stuffy or it's, it's not for me, it's not relevant, 
this series right here. <laughs> this series right here will help them to see that, man, we can, we can teach the word of God, we can live the word of God, and it's an exciting and fun process and life for us. So hand these out to anybody you can. We're going to be drinking sodas and eating popcorn up in church, a lot of fun, and so get excited for that. Come on, let's jump into the word today. We're starting a new series called Trinity, a new series called Trinity, and no, I did not just do that so I could teach about the Father on Father's Day. It was a coincidence. It was a coincidence. <laughs> it was a coincidence. I'm, I, I'm telling you, it really was. It really was. But in the Bible, from, from Genesis to Revelation, there are clues that indicate God's triune nature. That, that God is three in one. There's a Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay? And, and one of the scriptures that talks about this is Jesus speaking in John 14, 16. He says, I will ask the Father. So this is Jesus speaking, and he says, I'm going to ask the Father. He's over there, and he will give you another advocate. He over there, the Holy Spirit, who will never leave you. So there's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all in this one verse, all in this one verse, and the reason why I, I wanted to do a series like this is because some people don't understand and some people get it really confused that, you know, it's like, it's only Jesus. And when he was praying, he was just pretending because it's all him. It's, it's, no, that is ridiculous. Jesus is not a liar. There's actually a father. There's actually a son. There's actually a Holy Spirit, but they're actually one. It's a complicated, um, it's a complicated topic. And that's why I want to talk about it in church, y'all because I want you to understand it. I want you to be equipped. Lifeline Church, come on, you're going to know. You're going to know. It's going to be wonderful. Now, this word in this scripture right here, another helper, another is a Greek word pronounced by this gringo, Alan. It's like Alin, but Alan, because that's just the best I can do. I don't speak Greek. I know how to read it, though, and I know the definitions. Alan is another, and it means another of the same kind. Not another of a different kind, like a separate helper, a different helper, Another helper is, means another of the same kind. And that shows that Jesus is a representation of the Father because Jesus said himself, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father because I point back to the Father. But then Jesus says right here in this passage, he says the Holy Spirit is gonna come and he's gonna be another helper, another of the same kind. And the Holy Spirit's gonna lead you back to me. And other, other places in the Bible, he says that the Holy Spirit is gonna remind you of everything I've said. So it's like, I think of like that Spider-Man meme, you know, they're all pointing at each other. You know the one? <laughs> it's like the three Spider-Mans and they're all like, they're all Spider-Man, okay? But it's, that's kind of like the Trinity. That was ridiculous. If I was teaching in kids' church today, that's what I, it's too late. It's too late. It's already done. So let's talk about the Father. It is Father's Day after all. Let's talk about this first person of the Godhead, the Father. What, and so my, my question to you this is rhetorical. You don't need to shout it out or anything like that. I know how how wily first service can be. But what comes into your mind when you think of God? What comes into your mind when you think of God? It, and it could, be, it could be the most important, important thing in your life. The, the image that comes to your mind when you think of God could be one of the most important aspects of your life. Why? Because if you have a right idea of who God is, things in your life will end up going right. But if we have a wrong idea of who God is, then our, our lives just tend to go wrong. Let me, let me just put some things out there that many of us think about. Um, sometimes when we think of God, we think an impersonal cosmic force, you know, like the force. May the force be with you. And he's just this impersonal spirit entity kind of like energy. I just like to follow energy, God. Well, hang on a second. Well, that's not, that's not quite right. We need to talk about that. How about this? How about when a lot of people think of God um, like Grandpa God? Like old man river, you know what I'm saying? Like old man guy, like grandpa, he's a sweet old guy. He's been around forever. He's not moving as good as he used to. <laughs> the font on his phone is so big, you can read it from the kitchen. Come on, come on. He doesn't know how to use uh, speech to text. He doesn't know how to use Spotify, but he's probably got some candy on him somewhere. Come on. Yeah, he's just, he's, he's nice, but he's just not relevant. And some people, you would never articulate it like that. I understand. But in our minds, that's kind of how we look at God. Maybe we think of God as a divine scorekeeper. Every score and every miss and every, every mistake I made, he's just keeping track. And then, squash, there's going to be a reckoning. There's going to be, a, how about a heavenly butler? Oh, no, 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 no. Let's, let's talk about this one. He's my heavenly butler. No, pastor, I would never, ever say that. But we live our lives generally not thinking about God at all until there's a need. 
until I need him, until my marriage is on the rocks, until my finances are not in order, until I need something. And then it's, hey, Siri, hey, Alexa, uh, can you go ahead and fix my whole life? Can you fix my marriage? Can you fix my relationship? Can you fix my finances? Can you fix my health? And he, he does. And then it's, thank you, Alexa. Thank you, Siri. I'm going to go ahead and move on with my life because he's a butler and he's there when I need him. But when he's not, I'd like him to be kind of out of sight because I'm living my life. I know none of you would ever do that. I would never accuse anyone of doing that. I'm, I'm a nice guy. I would never do that. I'm just saying some people, other people, probably people from other churches, not you. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. When I was growing up, my view of God was very twisted as well. Um, I didn't grow up in the church. I grew up um, just kind of with good values in my home, make no mistake about it, and my parents watched first service, and so they did a, such a good job. They did such a wonderful job. They're amazing people. Happy Father's Day to my pops. Love them. But my first Bible, this is not my first Bible. My first Bible came from uh, my grandmother on my dad's side, and uh, Elizabeth, Grandma Libby, as we know her. Um, may she rest in peace. Love her. She gave me my first, uh, she gave me my first Bible. At least I heard it was from her. Anyway, it's not important. It was an old King James, leather-bound, big old thing, like that big, King James. And here I am, like, I don't know how old I was, 11, 12, 13, I'm not sure. And it's, thou art holy Lord, this and that. And, I'm, and I get this thing. I've never been to church, really. I don't know what's going on. I got this big, thick Bible, King James language, and I'm going. And I'm an impatient kid, so I just flip to the back, Right? That's a reasonable thing to do. Why don't we just see how this thing ends? So I flip to Revelation in a King James Bible. You ever read Revelation in a King James Bible? It's exciting. It's exciting. I start reading about seven-headed dragons. I start reading about prostitutes. I start reading about all, all kinds of fire, and people are dying of plagues, and then there's a bowl of plagues. What's a bowl of plagues look like, man? It was, I was, and I went, Close that, because <laughs> I'm freaked out now. And my, my image of God was that of, he's just wild, man. This is wild. I can't understand it. It's wild. So I have this understanding of God that he's just crazy out there. And so my life turned out crazy and out there. It's funny how that works. It's like our idea of God can really impact our life. I'm not saying because I got a King James Bible and I didn't have any youth pastor to like coach me and I didn't have any children's worker. Like we got our kids in, in, in our classrooms right there and they're being taught the truth of the word of God right now. Right now. They are, those servants in there, those dream teamers in there, those classroom teachers in there are teaching my own kids and yours too the truth of who the father is. And you know how much we need that because if we're left to our own and trying to figure it out on ourselves in a King James Bible, we could come up with some funky ideas. Thank God for Joshua and Annalie leading our youth this last semester. Come on, <laughs> teaching these teenagers because that's who I was. I was a teenager without a youth pastor, without anybody really like saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> you don't need to read Revelation just yet. Like, why don't you start in the Gospels? Like, simple things would have gone a long way. Thank God for those, but I didn't have any of that, so my my concept of God and my idea of God, which was like unrestrained and just kind of went crazy, and then my life ended up going crazy. So we need to understand who the Father is. If you understand God's true and good nature, we tend to have good and true lives. That's, that's what I mean. So let's understand the Father. Let's talk about understanding the Father. The first part of God's nature to understand is him as a father, him as a father. It's the first and primary characteristic about our Heavenly Father is this, the Father is love. The Father is love. Oh, by the way, this is a great time to take out your notes because there's, there's some blanks in there. I think I forgot to mention that. That's okay. You guys are following along great. I love it. The Father is love. It's not how he acts. It's not what mood he's in for this generation. No, it's who he is. He is love. And there's a big difference. I'm going to explain to you the difference between how someone acts and who they are. We can modify our behavior. We can try and white knuckle it and act nice, but God is love. He's not trying to be loving. He is love. Let's read it out of 1 John chapter 4. It says this, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 
God is love. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. See, we're putting our trust in God's love as if it's an attribute of his. It's not an attribute of his. It's who he is. Putting our trust in God's love, in love, is trusting in God. You, you see, it's like all throughout that scripture, it's the most defining characteristic for Father God is love. It's love. We have to start there. Because if we build on any other premise, if we build on, if we build on holiness, if we build on character modification, if we build on you got to repent, if you build on anything else other than love, we can get caught up and all spun around outside of his nature, outside of what he truly is, who he truly is. See, people can act out of character. You and me, we act out of character all the time. I do when I'm hungry. Come on, somebody. I need a Snickers bar when I need one, and I need one a lot. Okay, I'm a hungry boy. When I'm hungry, I don't act like myself. And when I'm too full, I don't act like myself either. When I'm tired, okay, just the other day, it was a little bit late at night, okay? And I'm, I'm an early to bed, early to bed guy. So if I'm around people, if I'm around you at 930, I'm just warning you ahead of time, I'm not myself around 930. I'm like, I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying so hard to be normal, but I just can't pull it off. I'm so weird. Like after nine o'clock, just don't talk to me because uh, I'm, I'm winding down big time. And it's easy for us to be out of character because the, uh, the food we eat impacts us, how tired we are, what happened to us that day. It's easy for us to act out of character, but God never gets hungry. You see what I'm saying? He never gets tired. Do you hear what I'm saying? He never acts out of character. It's who he is. Love is who he is. It's not, it's not what mood he's in. I, I'm, I'm trying to like, I'm hammering this in because it's so, so important. And you can't build on who God is without knowing that love is who he is. Love is who he is. He corrects us because that's what love is. He, he shows us right and wrong in life because that's who love is. He shows us how to live our life because that's what love is. He is love. It's not as mood as who he is. All right, so moving right along, the Father loves the world. We need to understand where this love is directed, right? His love, who he is. Is it just reserved for some people, not for other people? He's mad at some people, but he's nice to me because he likes me better than you. No. He loves the world. He loves the whole world. You thought I was going to say yes, huh? My wife did. <laughs> she knows that about me. We must know that love is who he is, and that love is directed at all of us. At all of us. Listen to this. The most famous passage in your whole Bible is John 3, 16. And it says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Some, this, some have this idea about God, and I'm going to try not to linger on this too long because it's, it's a big subject. But some people have this idea that God is just mad at the world. There's all this injustice. There's all this sin. You know, it's so rampant. And God must be up there just crossed his arms and tapping his foot. He's like, oh, a bunch of sinners down there. He's just so upset at us. What did I say earlier? What we think about God, it could be the most important thing about our lives. Because if we think of God as, as being something, he's just like sitting over the world going, oh, a bunch of idiots. Gosh, man. The, these people are idiots, those people are idiots, people on this side are idiots, people on that side are idiots, and, and we have this idea that God must be just so mad. But certainly, and let me, let me be clear, there are certainly things in the world that grieve God's heart. God doesn't love everything we do, all right, because we act outside of, of his love for us, right? We do. But think, keep this in mind, we're his creation. We're his, he created us not to hate us, to love us. That means the person farthest from God right now, it doesn't mean he loves everything they're doing, but he loves them. He, he created them. He created all of us. Aren't you glad that God drew you in into a relationship with you? If you are walking with God right now and you know what it means to be walking with him and having a relationship, aren't you glad that he loves you and sent his son to die for you and drew you in and had people around you that were bringing you in? He loves you. He loves the world. He loves that person that you hate. This is, I can't, I can't stick around here too long because I'm just, that's not my style, all right? I love my kids. Let me, let me paint the picture a little bit. I love my kids. I love them with all my heart. I made them. 
They're mine. If I'm supposed to love anybody, I love them. I love them more than life itself. But do their choices bug me at times? Absolutely. Every day. <laughs> I'm sorry. Keep it chill, Elliot. Keep it chill. Yes, does their ignorance bother me? Sure it does. Sure it does. Um, but even as an imperfect earthly father, I still love them. And we are his children. Keep, keep that in mind. We are his children. So this is the next point I want to share with you is, is we're his children. This is understanding the father. We are his children. He is our father. He's not just a father. He's our father. We are his children. We're not his workers. Oh, we love to talk about ourselves as workers and servants and, oh, I'm a slave to Christ, and so I'm a slave and all this. But primarily, first and foremost, you are a son and a daughter to the most high God. You are heirs and co-laborers. That's what the scripture says. You are heirs. That means you're, you're a son. You're a daughter. That is your primary role with him. He's your father. He, Jesus said to pray, our father who art in heaven. Not my boss in the heavenly high rise. Not my slave driver. Oh, my slave driver, thank you so much. No, he didn't tell us to pray like that. Jesus told us to pray, our father. Our Father, not my Father, our Father. Mm. 2 Corinthians 6, 18. And I will be your Father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. How much clearer could it be? It's all throughout Scripture. This is just one of the verses I wanted to use today. We hear so much about the things we're supposed to do sometimes. And make no mistake about it, there are some things we're supposed to do. There are some things we're not supposed to do. But we don't serve a God of character modification, behavior modification. We serve a God who is love, and we are sons and daughters of him. That's our relationship with him. On this Father's Day, I want you to hear this. We end up thinking God of, as our manager if we go that other route. God's not your manager. He's your father. He's your father. You got to be holy for God is holy, right? True. But he's your father. And when you don't get it right, what does a father do? welcomes you back, takes you back, loves you, loves you. If we're not careful, we can get a twisted, works-based relationship with Father God, and performance is not the goal. Sonship is the goal, or being a daughter is the goal. Um, my son, let's talk about my youngest son. I have an older son who's 19. I have a younger son who's six. My younger son is a wily boy. <laughs> let's talk about Evan for a second. He is a wily boy. Spills and thrills, baby. Spills and thrills. Mud and sticks. He's a man. He is all boy. All boy. If there's a tree, he's climbing it, okay? That's, that's who Evan is. But I I'm more of a neat and clean kind of person. You can tell by my outfit, it's like no colors. All right, everything's straight. Everything's like, oh, I got like everything's gotta be a certain way. So he, him and I, we, you know, when he comes in mud up to his waist, and he's like, yeah, check out this rock I found. <laughs> like, cool. Grab a mop, dude. <laughs> um, this this week I watched him. This week uh, we had some friends over. And uh, he was trying to help. And he's all boy. He's trying to make one trip, all right? And so he was going to help us by taking a pitcher, a gallon pitcher of iced tea and lemonade, like one in each hand. He's six, right? He's like this tall. And his arms are like that big around. He's got a gallon jug in each hand. And he's like, I'm going to help. And I'm going I'm to take these gallons and I'm going to walk over here. The screen door's not even open. How are you going to even open the door, bro? What are you thinking? He's not thinking. And so he takes them and he's like, yeah, I'm helping. But then he starts to lose and it's just <laughs> dumping lemonade and iced tea all over the floor. Like it's pouring. It's like he's pouring it out. He's pouring it out. And I look at him, you know, and then there's, there's people there too. So I'm like, Evan, dude, what are you doing? So he, and he's softy too. So like any type, type of tone of voice that changes, he's like, all upset you know what I mean I don't even have to say anything all I have to do is say Evan in the wrong tone and he's like heartbroken and so he well he got grumpy he got grumpy I'm grumpy everybody's grumpy the story goes on okay the story goes on the next morning the next morning he wakes up early and and he's out in the living room sitting on the couch with a little blankie on him um and uh it's so sweet I seen him out there and he just all by himself in the quiet and the kind of cold, so he's got a, so what did I do? I didn't bring up the iced tea and lemonade. I sat next to him. I got under the blankie. 
I snuggled with him. We had a father-son moment. I mean, they're few and far between. But it was a moment, man. That's what our father is like. That's what our father is like. He, it's not that he loves when we make mistakes. He doesn't, he doesn't want us to make mistakes. He, he wants us to continue to do better. It's not that I didn't care about the mistake that got made. I just care more about my relationship with him. That's who God is. He wants to be close to you. Even if you make mistakes, he wants to be close with you. And I hope that action, I hope that action shows Evan how to walk in love even more. It shows him that even if I make mistakes, even if I do things that irritates my dad, my dad's always there to snuggle with me. Let's talk about walking in love. So if all this is true about God, if all this is true about the Father, let's talk about walking in love. How do we walk this out? What does this mean for us? Father, Father God is love. He loves the world, and the world is full of his children. So how does that impact us? How does that change us? What does it matter? If he's love, what does that matter to us? And what does it look like for us to be actually walking in this love that God so freely gives and who God is? The first way to walk in love is to, is to do this, confess to him. It may not make sense right away, okay? It may not make sense. You're like, well, wait, what does that have to do with anything? I'll show you. Confessing to him shows honesty and openness. Love with someone is, is open. Even if there's, if there's tension, if something's wrong, there's an openness there. There's honesty there. There's, there's, there's a connection. So it's impossible to walk in love without having that openness, without having honesty, and that starts with confessing to God. The Father is someone we can talk to, and he wants us to talk to him. I'll show you in Scripture, 1 John chapter 1. It says, if we claim we have no sin, you say, no, nope, mm -mm, no, nope, mm, right here. No, everything's fine. Everything's fine in my life. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves. Don't be a fool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that was as hard as it's going to be today. <laughs> We're fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. What is, it, what is the Bible showing us? The Bible is showing us, the word of God is showing us that if we have that openness, if we have that honesty, like our cleansing, our healing, everything that we really are looking for coming to church, coming to God, everything we're looking for, our, our, our healing, our, our restoration comes from openness and confession to him. Confession leads to everything that we're looking for in a relationship with God. Starts with confession. That's big. That's a big idea, man. If we can confess to him and, and make it a habit, make it regular, make it something that, oh, man, that, that's not right. That doesn't line up with scripture. That doesn't line up. With, I know I, oh, that's just, I shouldn't have done that. God, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't do that. Just being open and willing to confess your shortcomings, beginning with God, that'll change everything. That'll change everything. A willingness to acknowledge the areas in your life that need change. I want you to do this. When God shows you an area in your life that, that might need the change, that maybe something in, in the scripture that you know, oh, I, I ought to be doing this, or maybe I ought to not be doing that, anytime that you're faced with that, just start with openness. Just begin to talk to God about it, even if, even if it doesn't get fixed. You know, because that's the thing. We think if I'm not right, I have to go privately and get right before I can be open with God about it. He already knows. <laughs> he's already, he's there, okay? He's seen it. He saw it, all right? When, when there's an area in your life that God shows you that ought to change, just confess it. Be open about it. Be open about it and simply acknowledge it, confess it. And I want you to, let's take it another step, confess it to God, but also to others. Now, that's the next level. That's the next level. Confessing to God is one thing because you can do that in private and no one will ever know that the thing is there. All right, the next level is to confess to God and then a safe person. Listen to what James 5 says. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you will be healed. That you will be healed. You're healing like what you really are looking for, that restoration, that hope. The, the things that you're looking for come from confession to God and confession to others. Like, hey, uh, my trusted friend, I want you to know about this area of my life. I, God showed it to me and I'm just telling you, I'm really working on this right now. I'm working on it. Getting it out to someone can just save your life. 
uh, again, about kids. I mean, this is Father's Day after all, and we're talking about a father, so i got a little illustrations about kids today. Kids, I know the first battle is confession. I mean, think about it. Chocolate all over the face. Did you eat the brownie? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. They can't even see themselves. They got the chocolate all over their face. It's on their shirt. You got mud on your hands, and you're like, no, nah, I wasn't playing outside. What are you talking about? <laughs> confession tends to be the first battleground. Like, if I can just get you to be open, I mean, why do kids do this anyways? Like, why are they so scared to tell the truth? I'll tell you why. It's fear. Fear of, of, of shame, uh, fear of punishment, fear of rejection. Parents, listen up. Be careful about this. Be careful about this. Make confession a safe activity for your kids. That will translate into their older years. It will translate into their relationship with God. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure, parents. It's like their relationship with God is now up to you, but it's your, your parent. You know, you're their parent, and they will learn from you. I'm not, I'm not breaking any new ground here. Like, you already know that. So let's make confession a safe place. Does that mean you're never going to correct them? Does that mean you're never going to steer them the right way? Of course you are. Of course you're going to do that. But let's make confession safe. Because if we can't help our kids be honest with us, we'll never be able to do much else. Because if they won't be open and honest with us, we won't be able to deal with anything else, especially as they get older. The next thing I want to talk to you about walking in love is is to listen to him. So you've confessed to him, but now we've got to listen to him. And another way to say this would be to obey how Father coaches us to live. Obey how Father God coaches us to live through his word, through right here. There, it's, all, it's all right here. Everything we, we absolutely need to know can be found right here. And there's some things in there that, that rub us the wrong way. I understand that. <laughs> I'm as normal as anybody else. I'm a, I'm a pretty average guy for standing up here, supposed to be talking to people about spiritual truths. And I've studied this. I've studied this. Where I study it every single day. Every single day I read this Bible. And there are things in there sometimes that go, dang, I'm supposed to forgive who? I don't want to forgive them. I'm supposed to do what? I'm supposed to do. And it's gotten better over time. But we need to all be aware that, that this is a manual for us. This is, a, this is an opportunity for us to grow closer to our Heavenly Father. A lot of people know uh, the first part of this passage I'm going to show you, but they don't know the second part. So uh, I'll read you the first part, and I'll see if anybody knows the second part. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light to my path. I mean, raise your hand if you've ever heard that. Your word is a lamp to my path. Yeah, like half of you. Half of you have heard that before. The second half says, I've promised it once. I'll promise it again. I will obey. <laughs> That's pretty staunch right there. He said, because it's very poetic, the first verse. Oh, yeah, you just show me. And the second verse says, I'm going to do it. You've shown me. Now I'm going to do it. I'm resolving in my heart to do what your word says to do. I will not only hear, but I will do what your word says to do. That's what walking in love means. That's what walking in love looks like. Watch this in James 1.22. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. There it is again. Don't be a fool. (laughs) Don't be a fool. It goes on in that same chapter to say it's like a person who looks in the mirror, sees what's wrong, and then walks away and goes, oh, I forgot. (laughs) It's like you got something on your face. You look in the mirror and say, oh, there it is. You're like, I'll get it later, and then just walk away, and you forget that it's there. That's what looking into the perfect law of God is like, and we don't do what it says. Uh, Another passage in Scripture says it's hearing the word of God and putting it into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock, and when the winds came, and the storms came, his house didn't fall. Why? Because he did the things. He put into practice what the word of God told that man to do. I want, I want you to be wise. Not just for wisdom's sake, because I want, when the storms come, I don't want you to fall. Like, what do you think my job is here? I, I want you to do well in life. I want to show you God's word. I want you to put it into practice. Not, not for any other reason, but because it's going to be a blessing to you. It's going to help you. It's going to help you weather the storms of life. It's going to help you to to survive when those tragedies come, when those hard times come. When we live our life based on this word, it saves us. It saves us. I don't don't need us. I don't need anybody to just obey the word of God just because I'm, you know, because I'm supposed to do it. 
No, it's because there's actually a benefit. What I'm trying to say is God doesn't just say to do things for no reason. When he says that we ought to, we ought to forgive and we, we ought to live holy lives and we ought to, we ought to do the right thing, it's, it's for a reason. It's because that's how the kingdom of God works. And, and just by the way, uh, the main function of the Holy Spirit, this is a series on the Trinity after all, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The main function of the Holy Spirit is to remind us like tap, 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 tap. During our busy lives, we're running around. I'm at work. I've got school. I'm running around. i got things at home. And then we got to run them over to soccer practice or baseball practice or football practice. You guys in your sports, man. It's just crazy out there. It's cra- us too. Us too. It's crazy out there. And when we're running around crazy life, the Holy Spirit is the one that goes tap, tap, tap. But remember, God said, remember, the word said, Remember, Jesus said, tap, tap, tap. The Holy Spirit is the one that lives inside of us and is with us, around us, filling us up to overflowing to remind us of all the things because it's a big book. (laughs) We're supposed to remember a lot of stuff. The Holy Spirit empowers us and brings to our remembrance the things that we're supposed to know at the right time. Man, that's a good thing. That's part three. Don't miss it. Tiffany's gonna bring the word on that one and it's gonna be so good. So this is what I want you to do, walking in love. You've confessed to God. You've confessed to a person. That's great. Now it's time to pony up (laughs) and take that part of your life that's not lined up with Scripture. Do something to change it. Do something to change it. I know this, again, about kids, about kids. It takes longer than you want for them to get it just right. Uh, I know this because I've told my kids to clean their room before. And they don't just get it. They, They go in there, and hours later, it's messier than it was when they went in there. It's crazy how bad kids are at stuff. I'm, bu- I'm just blown away by it. I'm blown away by it. Um, but that's why I don't look for perfection in my kids. I look for progress. I look for what direction are you going into. I think that's, that's the father's heart too. He's not looking at your perfection. He's looking at which direction are you going. Not how far along are you. I mean, think about it. How else could a, a, a man who's been saved like four and a half years be invited to even co-pastor with another, with, with another pastor, my wife. How could I be invited to do that if I was only saved that long and only been coming to church even less than that? It's because I was always taught by my pastor and by the, the leaders in my life, it's not about how long you've been in the union. It's about your heart and how surrendered you are. And I'm not here to toot my own shofar. You know, I'm not here to toot my own horn. I'm just saying that no matter how far along you are or are not, I'm telling you, if you will just surrender, if you will just give your heart to him, be honest and open and begin to do the things that God shows you to do with that that spirit, with that heart of saying, I don't know, he's just my God, I'm just going to do what he says. With that kind of abandon, God can use that. I'm telling you right now from experience, God can use that. And that's my goal, to stay in that place as the years go on. Because we can kind of get stuck in the wrong place too. We get stuck in that legalism. We get stuck in that, oh yes, he's my manager God. Oh yes, he's my slave driver God. Oh yes, he's just, you know, I'm, I'm here to check the boxes. I'm here to do the things. Oh yeah, I paid my tithe. Okay, good. Okay, read my Bible in the morning. Okay, good. All right, check, 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 check. He's our father. He wants a relationship with us. He wants that kind of heart that says, even if I make mistakes. And yeah, are you going to get better at all those other things? Yes, you will. With the openness. Many times we get down on ourselves for not doing the right thing, for not being, we, we know the right thing. Sometimes we can't bring ourselves to do it. Don't raise your hand if you've ever been there. We've all been there. We've all been there. And that shame bubbles up, that guilt bubbles up, manifests. You know how it manifests usually? In pride. We go walk around like, oh yeah, I know what I'm doing. People who are the most insecure tend to be the ones that were walking around mostly like this. Don't you know that most bullies are the most insecure people? Most people that are, are trying to cover up their insecurities, cover up their shame, their guilt, their bad home life are the ones that are expressing the most confidence. So we walk around and sure sometimes all confident, oh yeah, I got my stuff together. When really on the inside, when you see that on the inside, it could be, this man, I don't feel like I'm doing as much as I should be. I, I don't feel like I'm that guilt, that shame, that insecurity. But if we can let go of our guilt, let go of our shame, and just begin to look at God as our Father, someone who loves us, a God who loves us, who gave his 
first and only son for us to die for us so that we could be made new, so that we could come into his kingdom, that'll change the way you walk around. It'll change the way you live. This is this last point and this last thing about walking in love. So we've, we've, we've confessed to him, we've listened to him. Now it's time to come home to him. Even if you feel like you're already home, uh, let's, let's talk about this. Let's talk about coming home to him. What the father really wants most is you with him. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. He wants to be with you. Not your perfection, not your sacrifice. God says in his word, I, I, I declare, I, want, I don't want your sacrifice. I want your, I want your person. I want your soul. I want your heart. I want you. <laughs> and I'm going to see it the way you live your life. I want you to be with me. There's no better illustration in God's word, I believe, for a father than that, this parable of, of Jesus called uh, the parable of the lost son. The parable of the lost son. It's a big scripture. I'm going to read it to you. Um, can you believe it? I got a paper Bible on the platform with me. It's crazy. <laughs> this is crazy. Father's Day for you. But I want to read it to you because this, it is Father's Day after all. And a lot of people, even though the, the commentators, the people who, who put this Bible together, they, they, they call it the parable of the lost son. But I, I see it as a parable about a father. I think, I think the subject is the father. That's just me personally. So let me just read it to you. It's out, of, it's out of Luke 15, starting in verse 11. Let's read. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. In other words, I don't want, you, I, I don't want to wait for you to die. I want your money now. It is a huge slap in the face. Huge slap in the face to ask for something like that. So his father agreed. That's weird. This is a story about a father. Pay attention. He, he still agrees. He still comes through for us, even if sometimes we're doing, doing not the right thing. His father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. There he wasted all of his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. He began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, he began to think of home. Sometimes when we're down and out the most, got to think of home. At home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare. Here I am dying of hunger. Here it is. I will go home to my father. Oh, that's that verse, man. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and, and you. Shame, guilt. I'm going to go home to my father, but I'm just going to be, I'm going to be a slave. I'm not going to be a son anymore. I'm going to be a slave. You know, I, I don't deserve it. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Verse 20, so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father, ignoring him, <laughs> said to the servants, he wasn't ignoring him. He was just so happy. Quick, put the finest robe in the house on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Kill the calf that we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For the son of mine was dead, and now he returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. <laughs> so the party began. This story hits me because that's exactly how I felt. I was so far, I was so far away from God. I, I felt like I didn't deserve anything that he had to offer me. I felt like I had abandoned him and I'd squandered all the gifts that he had given me, I squandered everything. And so when I got saved, you have to imagine I was you know, fresh out of jail, fresh out of the drug lifestyle, 
absolutely hurting everybody that came across my path, burning every bridge I possibly could, and just being an absolute terror. And when I came home to God, when I came home to God and, and, and met a God like this, it wrecked me. It wrecked me. This was, this was my experience for, for the people in my life. And thank God for good people who will tell you, for good leaders who will tell you, no, 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 no. It's not about what you did. You don't need to worry about that shame and guilt no more. No, you can, you can choose to now live in Christ and your, your old life is gone. The new life has begun. You are new in him. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for you. Even if you've been in church for a little while. <laughs> we can come to church just to, just to play church a little bit. But I'm telling you right now. I'm telling you right now. He wants you with him. He wants you with him. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, your true home is with God. And he runs home to welcome you when you decide to come home. I want to invite you all to come home to him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? I want to, I want to just pray for you and offer you a prayer right now. And no matter how far away you might feel from him, that God is this father right here that we find in the scriptures. He's waiting for you to come. He's waiting for you to come home to him. He's been sitting on the front porch, so to speak, looking far off, just hoping, just praying, just wishing that you would come back. Just hoping that you would come back to say, there's my son, there's my daughter. I've been waiting for this moment. I've been waiting. That's you. If you feel like you're far away, if you feel like you are distant from him, if you feel like you need that forgiveness today, if you feel like you are ready to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, to say, Father, I'm coming home to you. If that's you today, you want to come home to Father God, would you just lift your hands with me? I'm lifting them to you. Amen. I see you. Amen. Hallelujah. I see you and you. Hallelujah. Come home to him. Amen. I see you. Amen. I see you. Hallelujah. Church, let's pray a prayer together. Let's pray a, a prayer of confession. Say, Lord, I, I'm coming home to you, and I'm making my heart right with you. Church, let's pray together. Say, Father God, I give my heart to you. I give my life to you. Fill me with your spirit. Make me new. Forgive me of my sin. Show me the path that I should take and help me walk in it. Thank you for saving me. Amen. 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 Proud of you. Proud of you.